Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, AICT Asia PCR On Air 2020, the official scientific meeting of the Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, AFSA. And today you are attending the uh, Mectronic sponsored uh, symposium on advancement in bifurcation and renal denervation, the right procedure for the right patient. The learning objective for this uh, afternoon's uh, session includes, one, to understand when and how to select a DK crush technique, which is obviously a two-stent uh, strategy or provisional stenting in bifurcation cases. Number two is to learn uh, pros and cons of both DK crush and provisional stenting techniques. And finally, we're going to shift gear a bit and to consider which patients could be appropriate for renal denervation treatment for the treatment of uncontrolled hypertension. So in this uh, session's agenda, uh, what I do is that we're going to start out with a sort of a way up uh, debate sort of a format between Dr. Xiao Liang Chen from Nanjing People's First Hospital and myself on the topic of is two stands up front DK crush or one stand with potential bailout to two, a provisional strategy bifurcation technique, which, which one is the way to go? And this will be followed by a second uh, talk uh, involving two speakers, Dr. Ong Tiong Kiam and Dr. Wan Asmat uh, from Malaysia, both from Malaysia, to talk about the considerations for renal denervation patient selection. Specifically, they will be addressing the population question of and case profiles in those patients who are most ideally suited for uh, renal denervation. Dr. Ong Tiong Kiam will close the entire sessions with some key take-home messages at the end of the sessions. So to start off the ball rolling, I'm going to invite Dr. Xiao Liang Chen from China to give his uh, talk on his two stand up front, the way to go. Dr. Chen. Thank you, Professor Huan Jin Tan, to invite me to join your ARCT PCR Asia. A slightly changed the topic of my presentation to ease up from the two stand DK crush is a way to go. This is my disclosure. So basically, so far there are only four randomized clinical trials to compare different standing technique for coronary bifurcation lesion, particularly from slide you can see. These four clinical trials compared a provisional with a two stand technique for bifurcation lesion. Two came from Europe, and another two came from my DK Quasi Serial trial team. So uh, you can see Cactus and the BBC1 two studies compared a provisional with the classic Quasi or different kinds of two stand technique. However, I have one year follow up, there was no significant difference in terms of the maze. So, in general, the conclusion could be a provisional standing technique is, is some, somehow uh, much better than two standing technique. But the remaining question is a difference, treatment, a difference between provisional with one stand compared with a provisional with a two standing technique. On the other hand, from our DK Quashi 2 and DK Quashi 5 study, we compared the DK versus provincial standing technique. Even finally, at one year follow up, we got negative clinical results from our DK Quashi 2, but in our DK Quashi 5 study, only including distal left main true coronary bifurcal lesion. So there was a significant reduction of one year tidal lesion failure of the DK Quash compared to provincial standing technique. So briefly, we can conclude the DK Quash is much better than provisional standing technique from our DK Quash serial trial. Also, from our DK Quash 3 study, we compared the DK Quash with a cool lot of standing technique for distal left man bifurcal lesion. So from this study, so a tremendous finding was a significant difference in lesions complexity. For example, in character study, sub-branch lesion length was only eight millimeters. Also CTO, left man disease, and the patient with acute myocardial infarction were not included in characters, also not included in the BBC1 and nautical study. 
particularly, you know, from BBC One study, cause no collab. So the investigators did not report the side branch lesion lines, diameter stenosis. Furthermore, in Nordic study, which compared the provisional with different kind of two stand technique, ridiculously, side branch lesion lines was only three millimeter in provisional standing group compared to 11 millimeter in two stand group. By collab, the QCI confirmed side branch diameter stenosis was only 40%. On the other hand, from our DK Quachi 2 study, sand branch lens lens was around 12 mm, uh, and it was 16 mm in our DK Quachi 5 study, particularly CTO, left man lesion, and patient with acute myelin cardiac infarction were also included in these two DK Quachi study. So, probably, uh, the hypothesis was that probably the lesion complexity uh, will be correlated with the increased clinical events. But so far, there was no strong data to support provincial standing technique work, uh, work equally for simple and complex bifurcation. In 2018, ESC guidelines study that side branch diameter more than 2.75 millimeter, side branch lesion length longer than five millimeter, or if the operate fails, it will be very difficult to access the side branch after main vessel standing. So these three items are the uh, criteria to separate simple from complex bifurcation. But so far, I think it was not extensively accepted. So the next uh, step will be to how to define complex bifurcations. So this slide shows the definition criteria we reported in 2015. So basically for bifurcal lesion with Medina 111 or 0112 kinds of a true coronary bifurcal lesion, and also with sun branch diameter minimal 2.5 millimeter, we created one major criteria, either for this left man or non left man bifurcal lesion. So in general, the requirement for side branch lesion length was 10 millimeters, and the side branch diameter stenosis was 70% for distal left man bifurcal lesion and 90% for non left man bifurcal lesion. On the right box, also we provide six minor criteria, more than a mild classification, multiple lesion, very strange bifurcal angle, main vessel reference vessel diameter smaller than 2.5 millimeters, main vessel lesion length, a minimum 25 millimeter. Also lesions with thrombus. So according to the definition criteria, one major criteria plus any two minor criteria, so the lesion could be defined as a complex coronary bifurcal lesion. So this table shows the diagnostic value of this definition criteria for differentiating simple from complex bifurcal lesion, even we only rely on major criteria from table, you can see both sensitivity and specificity uh, were, uh, higher than 70%. So one major criteria plus any two minor criteria. So the diagnostic value could be increased up to 80%. So these criteria were built from a, a large database but it was never tested in any clinical trial since the publication of the DKI Quachi 5 trial. So we tested this definition criteria from two subgroups. On the right, you can see when patients with distal left man bifurcal lesion were included in the complex coronary bifurcal lesion subgroup, much higher one year TRF of the provisional standing technique. It was 18.2% compared to only 7% of the DK quash group. In the simple lesion group, even the digital of one year TRF of the provisional standing technique is still higher than 1.9% of the DK quash, but P value was not significant. So also, 
uh, we designed our definition to trial to compare the treatment difference between DK quality and the provenocetanine technique for real complex coronary bifurcan lesion defined by our definition criteria. I think this is the first randomized clinical trial to identify the efficacy, the feasibility, and the treatment effect of different standing technique for complex coronary bifurcan lesion. Finally, 660 patients were included in this trial. The primary endpoint was one year tidal lesion failure. In two stand group, only DK quasi and cooler standing technique were recommended in the two stand group. Finally, DK quasi was used in 77.8% in the two stand group. So at one year follow up, the primary endpoint tidal lesion failure was 11.4% in the provisional group compared to only 6.1% in the two stand group, mainly because of the high rate of clinical driven TLR and the target vessel myocardial infarction in the provisional group uh, compared to two stand group. So in summary, uh, among entire cohort of patients with bifurcan lesion, almost 25% of lesions could be defined as a complex bifurcan lesion. Of them, if the bifurcan lesion uh, had Medina 111 or 011, uh, two types of true coronary bifurcan lesions, the side branch lesion length, minimal 10 millimeter, or side branch diameter stenosis, 70% for distal left man or 90% for non distal left man bifocal lesions. So I prefer to suggest two stand approach could be the primary treatment, particularly DK quash is much better than so far currently used two stand technique in our daily practice. For example, cool out, T stand, reverse T stand technique or even provisional with TAP or provisional with t stand technique. On the other hand, for the remaining 75% of simple bifocal lesion, so we have to go for provisional standing technique. But finally, probably provisional could be transferred to provisional with one or even provisional with two stand technique. This is a particular uh, outcome for barrel after or side branch stand. At one year follow up, the primary endpoint one year tidal lesion failure was 11.6% in the provisional group compared to only 6.1% in the two stand group, mainly because of the high rate of clinical driven TLR and tidal vessel myocardial infarction in the provisional group. So, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, among entire cohort of patients with coronary bifurcan lesion, almost 25% of lesion could be defined as a complex coronary bifurcan lesion, uh, presented by side branch lesion lens, minimal 10 millimeter, side branch baseline diameter stenosis, 70% for distal left man, and 90% for the non left man bifurcan lesion. Uh, also, side branch diameter stenosis, minimal 2.5 millimeter with the Medina 111 and two kinds of true coronary bifurcan lesion. So for this true complex coronary bifurcan lesion, I prefer to suggest two stand approach could be the primary treatment, treatment. particularly DK quash is much better than culotte or provisional with two stand technique. For the remaining 75% of simple coronary bifurcan lesion, the primary treatment could be provisional standing technique with the van stand technique. Finally, some of the patient after provisional with one stand technique could be changed to provisional with two stand technique because of the requirement of side branch barrel after stand. Thank you. I finished. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for the opening uh, uh, address. I'm going to take a contrarian view by uh, going for one stage with potential bailout to two is being the way to go for a bifurcation uh, stenting. These are my following disclosure. 
Now, what is provisional standing? I think provisional or conditional standing should be defined as the uh, use of stands that are limited to those conditions and cases in which the operator, despite an aggressive balloon angioplasty and technique with large balloons and high pressure, is unable to obtain a result that uh, ensures an optimal chances of early and late patency. So one can look at a provisional standing as a one stand technique, or rather look at it as a strategy or philosophy where one stand uh, techniques may be employed and then subsequently uh, escalated to a two stand uh, strategy. So we can start off by looking at this particular case here. This is a patient with a distal left main and osteo LAD uh, stenosis, as you can see, with impaired blood flow. And so what we do here is uh, we just simply put a wire, pre-dilate, and put a stent across the left main and the osteo LAD stenosis. And after which, uh, once the stent is deployed, we will go ahead and do a post uh, deal uh, high pressure dilatations and also a port in the uh, main, the left main vessel. And if the results are pretty good, that's the end of the procedure. So this is a provisional uh, standing uh, strategy uh, that we talk about. And this is the other view. So we can look at a, a provisional standing as a technique where you basically insert a wire into the two different branches. This is followed by stenting of the main vessel and then followed by a porch technique using a balloon that is of diameter that is uh, adapted to the proximal uh, main diameter. There are some operators who believe in doing a, another step, which is to do a kissing balloon inflation, where you switch out for the guide wire. Then after which you put the uh, uh, guide wire and uh, into switch out from the side to the left main, left main to the side, and you do a kissing balloon inflation. So the last part is a optional treatment uh, in patients uh, undergoing a provisional stenting uh, strategy. Now, provisional stenting can be a very simple and fast procedure. It has got uh, excellent short-term and long-term results and reserves all other options in cases of uh, failure. Now, when do we do side branch stenting in provisional stenting? Typically, this will be in a situation where there is a side branch of flow impairment or there is major side branch dissection or when the side branch is diseased with significant residual ischemia, or where future access to the side branch may be important. But we know that in provisional stenting, oftentimes there could be a situation of coronal shift, and this can occur in 10 to 40% of patients. And when the coronal shift uh, happens, uh, the appearance uh, angiographically can be sometimes alarming, but we all know that there is a significant discordance between angiographic stenosis and the functional significance of the disease. And this we know from Dr. Ku's study, which states that in lesions, uh, side branch, where there's more than 75% narrowing, actually only uh, one third of which is functionally significant. The majority are actually hemodynamically not significant. In fact, if you look at the uh, DK Crush 6 study using uh, by Dr. Chen, uh, using angiography versus uh, FFR guidance in the treatment of the uh, side branch, there was no difference in one year cleaning out clinical outcome. So if you look at his DK crush study, only in angiographic situation where there's side branch stenosis of more than 70% and where there's significant uh, dissection of grade B and C or TIMI flow of less than three, then would uh, intervention of the side branch be performed. Now, actually, how often do we need to do a second stent in a provisional st strategy? Oftentimes, it depends on the series. In the Colombo series, up to 30% uh, have a crossover to a side branch standing, but actually the majority of the other study have hardly any cases, less than 5% uh, of need to go into a side branch standing in the provisional approach. Even if you need to go into a provisional uh, uh, standing of the side branch, uh, you can still use many techniques such as tap, reverse crush, and culoid, and with its own attendant advantages as well as disadvantages. But one of the things that accompany a provisional stand strategy that I want to emphasize is this proximal optimizing technique. And we have to, uh, first of all, choose the stand size according to the distal diameter. Then using a port technique with the distal balloon marker placed just proximal to the carina. And then to, uh, this will allow for easy side branch access after which. Remember, you, do, you need to know the balloon that you're choosing very well. Make sure that the balloon has a marker that is right at the shoulder of the balloon 
so that uh, there will be no excessive uh, damage to the distal vessel during a deployment of the balloon. The other step that some people use uh, to end the procedure is a kissing balloon technique. This is to modify the geometry of the uh, implanted stent and then improve the expansion in the proximal vein branch while also improving the access to the side branch. And this is oftentimes with a too non-compliant balloon. So what is the clinical evidence for provisional versus uh, two-stent uh, strategy? When we look at the Korean uh, COVID uh, Registry 2 uh, study, you find that actually majority of patients with non-left main bifurcation can be treated with provisional stenting. So this is in about 80%. Only 20% requires a two-stent strategy. In left main, only 40% requires a two-stent strategy, majority of which still uh, can be treated with a provisional approach. And that uh, two-stent strategy was noted in this registry to be associated with higher incidence of uh, major adverse cardiac event. When you look at randomized controlled trial, again, uh, which was alluded to earlier on, looking at all the randomized study, there was no difference between one stand versus two stands. In the only one that was difference in BBC1, actually uh, two stand strategy was associated with a worse uh, outcome. And when we look at Nordic BBC five-year follow-up, uh, you can clearly see that the uh, two stand strategy uh, was associated with a worse long-term mortality uh, during a, a long-term uh, follow-up of patients. And when you look at provisional uh, single stand standing in the meta-analysis, which include uh, uh, DK Crush 2 in this particular study, you find that it actually still favors a provisional stand approach. Uh, so then when should we choose a prov provisional approach? I think if you look at the European bifurcation perspective, they are quite uh, uh, circumspect in this, uh, uh, in this particular position, is that you want to keep things simple at all the time. You will stand with a stepwise provisional approach and you will add layers of complexity when necessary and end up with two stands only when uh, needed. When we look at this uh, uh, position paper that published by a number of the top uh, European uh, interventionists, you'll find that provisional approach is still the mainstay of the treatment of most of the bifurcation uh, stenosis. And so uh, when you look at our very own Asia-Pacific consensus document and looking at whether left main or non-left main bifurcation, if the side branch is not in uh, risk of jeopardy, provisional stenting is often the approach. Even if there's a risk of side branch and it's, if it's still not suitable for standing approach, provisional stenting is recommended. But if the patient has got a risk of side branch closure and is amenable to two stand strategy, you can still go on a provisional approach with uh, escalations to two stands, or one can go to a two stand uh, strategy right from the very beginning. And in, in which case, then we perhaps will recommend DK crush as a preferred technique given its well of uh, clinical uh, evidence. So uh, to conclude, I basically would like to quote from the Asia-Pacific Consensus document on coronary bifurcations intervention with regard to provisional stenting and noting that uh, actually my opponent, uh, Dr. Chen Xiaoliang, is actually one of the uh, co-author uh, of this uh, particular consensus paper. And he actually specifically mentioned also that the provisional stenting is the default strategy for patients with bifurcation stenosis. And that uh, provisional st stenting uh, uh, strategy uh, in a side branch treatment should only be performed when clinically important and uh, when the side branch is functionally compromised following provisional stenting. So in many ways, Dr. Chen and I do share the same uh, sort of uh, 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 position that uh, whilst provisional stenting approach should remain as the uh, uh, default strategy, certainly in cases of complex bifurcation stenosis, a two stand approach is necessary, and we would uh, recommend DK Crush just because of its uh, wealth of uh, clinical evidence. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is TK Ong. I'm an interventional cardiologist working at the Sarah Heart Center in Malaysia. The topic we are going to talk about uh, in this session is renal denervation. Renal denervation, as you know, is a new procedural best treatment for hypertension. Now, for this session, there'll be two of us presenting. 
uh, we are going to present slightly differing views, all right, on who are the patients who are suitable for renal denervation. I'll allow my core speaker, Professor Wan, uh, to begin his presentation. Professor Wan, please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this RBN section, which we focus on patient selection. Many thanks to Medtronic for giving us the opportunity to discuss this very important topic. My humble opinion, currently I will use RBN in patients with multi-drug resistant hypertension patient only. TK is happy to endorse RDN for a wide range of patients. For this talk, I do not have any potential conflict of interest to report. What is the scope of the problem? Hypertension is the single largest contribution of death. Hypertension is a global health crisis. About 1 billion people in the world have hypertension. In 2025, it's expected that 1.6 billion people have hypertension. What the issue with hypertension? About one third of patients with hypertension are not treated. Another one third of the patients are treated, but their blood pressure are not controlled. Only about one third of the patients who are treated who have their blood pressure control. Hypertension and its sequence contribute a significant cost to the budget health care of any country in the world. What do you mean by resistant hypertension? These are patients whose blood pressure are not controlled and the maximally tolerated doses of more than three class of antihypertensive medication for one month or more. Patients are not adherent. They have inscrutable causes such as a denial, inconvenience, forgetfulness, and actually not adherent can be unexplainable and sometimes can be perplexing and baffling. Patients who have blood pressure who are not controlled is due to intolerance to the medication or suffer from side effects of blood pressure lowering agent. So in a busy clinical setting, it's always challenging to de determine whether the patient is adherent to medication or not. In most studies, quoted that 50% of the patient who are antihypertensive medication become inherent after one year. And when blood pressure is not controlled, if we ask the patient whether they would like us to add another antihypertensive medication, then they were willing to give two years of your life instead of adding, taking one more extra pill. So what we have to offer to this patient? Patients who have multi-drug resistance, patients who are not adherent to medication, and patients who have side effects to this medication. So hypertension medication work by interfering with physiological pathway, whereas RDN is interventional rather than a pharmacal way to treat hypertension. Renal innovation have a, a good sign behind it, and they have a lot of preclinical and clinical data to support the effect, effectiveness of renal innovation in treating hypertension. So renal innovation is a different approach for uncontrolled hypertension, particularly patients who have multi-drug resistance, patients who are not adherent to hypertensive medication, or patients intolerant or suffer side effects of antihypertensive medications. So if we compare the first generation uh, renal innovation catheter, that is a flex catheter, with the second generation renal innovation catheter, the simplicity spiral, uh, there's a lot of improvement in, in this catheter. This catheter has a unique design, automatically positioned electro to generate 360 degree ablation. That's consistent, repeatable, four quadrant pattern, and just only, only about 60 seconds to do the innovation compared to the previous catheter 
will it should require two minutes. So with just one catheter, you can treat a vessel between three to eight millimeter, the main branch and the side branch of the renal artery. And it's a user-friendly, you only need a six French guide and therapy exchange with 0.014 wire system. And so we have hypertension off medication, off med, uh, which was presented uh, already in Europe, uh, in anything. And then the spiral hypertension on med, which also presented in the European side. And now we have the spiral off med pivotal trial, which was presented recently during the ACC meeting. So the, the off med uh, pilot trial was the test of concept, the trial to test the concept. And the on med to show the efficacy trial. And if you look at the 24 hour BP uh, and also off and also the office blood pressure in both the off med and the on med medication, it showed a clinically significant reduction of blood pressure, which is statically significant. Now we can the spiral hypertension of back pivotal trial design. Uh, these are patients with uh, office blood pressure of 150 to 180 or 24 hour BP of 140 to 170. So if they fulfill uh, the criteria, inclusion criteria, then they are randomized uh, into the renal innovation arm or the shame control arm. And the primary endpoint is the three month office blood pressure and the 24 hour blood pressure. Of note that uh, they have a uh, drug uh, uh, test for the urine and also for the blood to make sure that patient is compliant with the protocol of the study. So I just want to show you the result uh, of this trial, the pilot, uh, the off bed and the pilot trial between the two group, uh, the 24 hour stored blood pressure, we show a clinically significant, statically significant uh, in those patients who have been the patient compared to the shank. And similarly, the office, office blood pressure uh, for both the pilot and the pivoter, we show a significant reduction in the blood pressure. Okay, what more important is uh, those patients on the renal innovation, you show a consistent decrease in blood pressure over 25 hours. It's always on. And particularly at night and the, during the early uh, in the early morning search. As we know that uh, patients' uh, risk to base uh, are different during the day and the night time. And the, the night time, patients have the highest risk, and you let the renal renovation arm that this offer uh, a better reduction in blood pressure compared to the shank control arm. All right, in those patients who are on the shank, there are three times more uh, of these patients who have escape phenomenon, and two times more of them who require medication. Since these are interventional procedure, people are concerned about the safety of this procedure. So if you look at the RBN, there's only one patient admitted for hypertension crisis. And in the shared control arm, only one patient who are admitted because of a stroke. So if we look at uh, the other issue is whether renal innovation is effective for the long term. If we look at the, uh, uh, the, the global simplicity registry, so you look at the, there is an incremental increase in the reduction of blood pressure with renal innovation over three years uh, with the office blood pressure and the 24 hour blood pressure. So the take home message is how can your hypertensive multi-drug resistant patient benefit from RDN this group of patients offer the very high risk of major adverse cardiac effect. So renal innovation offer uh, an alternative for them for blood pressure to be reduced in this very high risk group patient. So this patient, we give them a, a better hope for them for the blood pressure to be controlled and at the same time reduce them from suffering from major adverse cardiac event. And also we can also discuss about patient preference to antihypertensive medication. So thank you for your attention. Now, in Professor Wan's lecture, he has presented to you uh, data to show that renal innovation is an effective treatment for hypertension. Now, I'm going to present a slightly 
uh, alternative view about you know, what are the patients that we should offer renal innovation to. Now, no doubt, the data that's been presented uh, shows that renal innovation works. The results, the, uh, the benefits of renal innovation are consistent across different studies and the effect of blood pressure lowering has been shown to be durable in multiple studies. However, if you look at the way uh, renal denervation works, right? The action of renal denervation is to get rid of the sympathetic uh, innervation of the kidneys. We know that stimulation of the um, uh, uh, sympathetic uh, innervation of the kidneys um, by the, well, in both directions, by both the efferent and efferent uh, uh, pathway um, uh, stimulation results in things like uh, salt and water retention, rain, increase in renin activity, and all these would then subsequently lead uh, to hypertension. And therefore, you know, renal innovation by getting rid of uh, the sympathetic system will help to lower blood pressure. But because of how it works, then it gives uh, rise to the possibility that renal innovation might work better in certain groups of hypertensive patients. You know, it might not work in every patient. It might work better in certain subgroups. And it might, the effects on sympathetic nervous system might have benefits beyond just blood pressure lowering. Now, if you look at the uh, 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 indications, uh, pot potential uses of renal denervation, all right, you can look at it from just a purely blood pressure lowering perspective. And that's probably what Prof. Wang was talking about, that uh, in the, those patients whose blood pressure is not, adequately controlled, and you're talking about those with resistant uh, hypertension, uh, then these are patients where you would offer renal innovation. And I consider that as, uh, as uh, what, what I would call uh, class one indication for renal innovation, all right? Obviously, if a patient's blood pressure is not controlled, we have to offer them some treatment, and renal innovation is an option for these patients. However, there are other groups of patients where the blood pressure might be adequately controlled with medications, or which can be controlled with medications. But because the mechanism of hypertension in those patients has a sympathetic hyperactivity etiology, these patients might respond particularly very well to renal innervation. And therefore, you know, this treatment can be considered as an alternative to medical therapy in selected uh, group of patients. So this Patients include those, you know, where the sympathetic hyperactivity manifests as, uh, for instance, a uh, high resting tachycardia, high resting heart rate, or these are the patients uh, where, who has uh, uh, early morning hypertension, you know, where they come to the clinic, the blood pressure might be normal, but this patient actually has an early morning surge uh, of uh, blood pressure. So these are all signs of uh, a hyperactive sympathetic nervous system. And this patient responds particularly well uh, to renal uh, denervation. And because of that, if you look at the recommendations of the Asian um, Renal Denervation Consortium, other than uh, recommending it for the standard uh, indications of uncontrolled hypertension, we did mention that it should be offered as an option for certain groups of patients, uh, like the one I mentioned just now, those with sympathetic hyperactivity, but also for those patients who have concomitant uh, medical conditions associated with hypertension, the hypertension may or may not be the cause of hypertension, um, may or may not be the cause of the other medical condition, but you know, they, it coexists with other medical condition and it makes the other condition worse. Things like patients with heart failure, for instance, or ki chronic kidney disease, or patients with uh, ventricular or actual arrhythmias. And by, the, uh, by reducing the sympathetic activity, you treat the other conditions such as heart failure or renal failure or arrhythmia. So these are the other group of patients where we can consider offering renal innovation as a treatment for their hypertension. Now, we are not saying that medication do not work. Medications do work. As many of these trials show, if you look at these studies, which are on pharmacological treatment for hypertension, all of them achieve, uh, well, almost all of them achieve at the end of the study, a systolic blood pressure of less than 140. So they work, all right? And their pharmacological therapy 
other than lifestyle modifications should still be first line treatment for hypertension. However, you have to be remember that to achieve this blood pressure in these clinical trials, you know, it was possible only with one medication in about one third of these patients. About one third of the patients need two medications to achieve a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of less than 140. And in one third of these patients in these clinical trials, they need three or more agents to lower the blood pressure. And so if the patients are on three or more medications and a lot of medications, then the issue of compliance becomes important. You know? And how sure can we be that these patients will remain on so many medications for so many years? of their life if they are diagnosed to have hypertension at an early age. And it is important to remember that patients, and has been shown probably by Prof1, has been shown by Prof1 earlier, tends to be non-compliant. So over time, they might reduce the medications that, that they've been prescribed, or they might take it wrongly. So if you ask them to take three times a day, they might twice a day. So there might be a, a loss of control of the blood pressure. So in it, you know, and when that happens, you know, and when we follow the patient up in the clinic, and if the drop is very minor, five millimeters, 10 millimeters, we might think, well, that's not a lot. You know, we can always bring the patient back uh, to the previous good control of the blood pressure. But if we fail to do that, right, then it has severe consequences for this patient in terms of uh, neurologic, uh, you know, strokes and heart failure and even cardiovascular death, as you can see uh, in this slide here. So, which is why I think the, uh, the um, you know, recommendations, I really like the recommendations by the Taiwanese group of uh, doctors, uh, you know, with regards to renal innovation. And of course, they talk about the, the standard uh, recommendations, uh, the standard indications, such as resistant hypertension, those who cannot tolerate medications, uh, you know, uh, who are intolerant to drugs, and, and uh, these are the standard ones, right? But they also have advocated that for those patients with secondary hypertension, obviously, for secondary hypertension, we have to treat the primary cause first. But there are some patients where even after treating the primary cause of hypertension, we still cannot control the hypertension. And some of these patients might also be candidates for renal denervation. Now, what is interesting that is that if you look at this, the layout of their recommendations uh, or selection of patients for renal denervation, central to that recommendation is the issue of patient preference. And I think in this day, modern day, in this day and age, um, it is important for us to um, talk to our patients, to discuss with them about treatment options and uh, which, what are their preference, and we have to take their preference into consideration in making a decision uh, about uh, which treatment is best for them. And, uh, and, and therefore, I think uh, ultimately, uh, once uh, renal denervation becomes established as a, a treatment for hypertension, uh, we should target not just those with uncontrolled hypertension, but we also target those who have certain conditions that will make renal denervation particularly attractive and useful treatment, as well as taking into consideration a patient's preference for the type of treatment that they would like to receive for their hypertension. Thank you very much. In this session, we have uh, discussed two important, uh, we, have, we have discussions in two op important uh, areas. The first uh, part of uh, this uh, event was on a discussion on treatment of bifurcation, lesions during PCI. And the second one was on renal denervation. Now, from the first part of uh, first uh, session on bifurcation, we learned that today, I think for the majority of cases, bifurcation cases that we treat, right, provisional stenting should still be the default strategy. And that is probably the majority of the bifurcation cases that we see in the cath lab. However, when we come across a complex bifurcation uh, lesion, then it is probably better for long-term result to adopt a two-strand approach right from the start. There are many strategies for PCI, uh, two stand strategies for bifurcation PCI. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, but uh, you know, and each one has their own strength and weaknesses. You know, the pros and cons. Uh, but I think the DK crush is probably one of the most widely evaluated technique currently, and it's the one that has uh, produced excellent results in a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, PCI uh, scenarios. 
With regards to renal denervation, uh, I hope we have um, uh, shared with you um, and convinced you about the effectiveness and safety of renal denervation. And this is supported by data from the Spiral uh, Hypertension Program, uh, and as well as uh, reward data from the uh, ongoing global uh, simplicity registry. Um, we have to be careful about our selection of patients for this uh, procedure. And although the first group of patients that we target should probably be those patients with uncontrolled hypertension, because they will be the ones who might benefit the most. Uh, however, in the longer term, I think there is probably a role for, the, for using renal innovation in other patient subgroups as well, other than just those with uncontrolled hypertension. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your participation uh, in this uh, session. Yeah.